Great, okay, I guess we can get started. Everybody, please give a warm welcome to Mihai. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining me today. So uh, I will share with you some of my personal experience regarding the virtual development environments. So uh, let's take a look at the main key points of this presentation. So the first one is consistency, or how your development environments should be similar in the actual production environment and in development. Uh, how, uh, about diver diversity, uh, or how your, uh, you should handle di di distinct environments for distinct projects. The isolation, or how your different environments should be different, uh, from different projects should not overlap and not break each other. Um, so, uh, in the beginning, let's see how uh, usually people, like Python developers, are uh, uh, doing their workflow. So, in order to have all of the dependencies uh, locally, you use pip or uh, the OS packaging tool, uh, installing pre-compiled uh, packages from the operating system package repository, or even use easy install to have all of them locally. But how do you do it? Uh, do, uh, do you have uh, do, do you install everything globally, or uh, you use uh, Conda or Virtual Env or any other uh, similar tools, uh, or perhaps you're on Vagrant? Uh, the last one actually is quite good when it comes to consistency, but otherwise it has a bit of an overhead. Okay, so now when you have finally your environment up and running, uh, your version control in place, and your features are freshly developed, how do you deploy it, and where? So you have definitely multiple options. Uh, you can do it uh, on a platform as a service provider uh, or on an in infrastructure as a service, service easily. Uh, you can even deploy it uh, on the old server that lives in your attic. The last two are quite similar when, uh, from the deployment perspective, uh, although you can't really rely on the trusty thing from your attic. So uh, virtual WANs ends are uh, re really popular nowadays. Uh, they're ac uh, accomplishing their goals perfectly fine. They're super simple. Uh, they run on top of the shared system libraries and packages, uh, but th here is a small problem, because running uh, on the shared system libraries that you cannot influence might be a problem. Uh, these underlying libs are, are different in different uh, distributions, uh, while some of the distributions uh, try to be uh, on the bleeding edge, other distributions are more conservative and concentrated on the stable packages. Uh, so even though it's possible to specify uh, the specific version of the internal Python dependencies uh, inside the virtual environment, frequently the dependency tree is not only bound by these uh, internal Python uh, dependencies, but also depends on the system-wide use libs. That brings inconsistency between different machines. Moreover, this uh, inconsistency might turn things upside down in production too, uh, when a given system dependency uh, differs in some manner from the one from the development machine. So whether something breaks, there is always this notorious excuse. So imagine for a second that uh, we can have the exact same thing uh, in uh, all of the uh, environments in which application is running. Even when you write in Python, which is an interpreted language, which results are not compiled into some kind of self-contained uh, binary. So let's containerize it. Uh, let's pack it uh, into something uh, more robust than a simple virtual environment. So we actually build a kind of binary with uh, all of its dependencies enclosed into it. Let's put it in a container. So as the Docker became an industry standard for the containerization, uh, all of my examples will be based on the Docker technologies. Uh, when I was rehearsing this talk, uh, at this point I got some questions like, uh, Docker is a virtual machine, uh, they said, uh, and I was asked how it's different from other virtualization, virtualizing uh, technologies. In fact, uh, virtual and, uh, sorry, in fact, containers are not uh, virtual machines. Uh, they are neither a, a lightweight virtual machine. They're just a process that runs under the same kernel. Um, uh, the process is just isolated and it's running in its own uh, namespace. <clears throat> so. Uh, here we can see the same uh, picture as before, but using uh, Docker containers. Um, it, so we have the Docker engine running uh, on top of the shared system libraries and packages, uh, and uh, the containers are all different, uh, the, and still it's somehow uh, similar to the virtual env situation. But the only th different thing is the fact that containers are uh, just self-sufficient. They have all of, this, uh, the, of the dependencies inside them. Uh, so they are portable, thus they are more, more robust. <laughs> so um, let's talk about container anatomy. 
Basically, containers combine just the two uh, features of the modern Linux kernel. Uh, those are C groups and namespaces. Um, so C groups are uh, enable user to prioritize and limit the system resources for a specified process. Uh, namespaces offer compatible. Uh, uh, namespaces actually uh, co uh, completely isolates an application's view uh, on the over the operating system. So it, it includes uh, process trees, networking, user IDs, and mounting file systems. Um, so let's see what is actually inside a container. It contains all of the system dependencies, own libraries, and has limited uh, endpoints uh, for access to and from the outside world. Uh, the container is built from an image which is immutable. Uh, Docker images are self-contained, as told before. Uh, they, are, uh, they have everything needed uh, for the execution bundled inside. Uh, they are isolated, so different images uh, don't share any parts of them. And they are immutable. Uh, what's in it basically stays in it. Uh, and of course, uh, they are portable, so you can move them to any machine and they will work just fine. Um, speaking about containers, the container is basically just an isolated process uh, that is disposable as well. So uh, if you break a container, you just delete it and start from scratch from the same image. Uh, containers are running over the image file system layers, uh, which is AUFS, so uh, everything happens in the container is just uh, a, a layer on top of the uh, image layers. So let's take a look how uh, the AUFS works. AUFS is a unification file system. It means that uh, it takes multiple directories on a single Linux host, stacks them on top of each other, and provides a single unified view on them. Uh, to achieve this, AUFS uses a union mount. Uh, that's how the images are immutable. Uh, a running container uh, is just a layer on top of the image layers uh, that are, by the way, read-only, as you can see. And that's how containers are disposable, so everything happens in this layer without being committed to the actual image. Uh, it's volatile, thus it's disposed at the time when the container is removed without altering the structure of the image. Uh, now if we stack multiple file system directories, uh, uh, it means that we can just add or override files. Uh, thus it's cumulative, so how to actually delete a file uh, without simply rewriting it with another one? <laughs> Uh, to achieve this, the union file system uh, driver uh, just places a, a whiteout file uh, in the container's top layer. So the white file, uh, whiteout file uh, just effectively obscures the existence of the file uh, in the read-only image layers below. So the file is basically still there, it's just not visible to the user. But beware, even though uh, the, you can delete uh, images, uh, we can delete files with whiteouts, it's worth remembering that it's still cumulative, and the size of the image will only increase. So don't commit to the image unnecessary files, where you'll end up having huge files for no actual reason. Uh, okay, so uh, up to this moment, it seems that uh, uh, all the data is immutable, the layers uh, in the image are read-only, so how actually to work with the applica real application data? Uh, a volume, uh, we, we will actually use for these volumes uh, to mount this external resource uh, to the uh, container. A volume ba basically is uh, this external thing. You, you can just mount a directory from the host to a directory to the uh, container. And uh, the, the volumes are not anyhow managed by the Docker, so they're never recycled or the Docker never deletes them when you remove, um, remove a container. Okay, so now uh, that we know all the needed primitives, uh, uh, let's see how uh, the images are actually built. So for that, we will need just two things. Um, the first one will be the raw product, or the source code of our application, and the next one will be the cooking recipe, which is uh, represented by a Docker file. So uh, that's basically how a super simple Docker file looks like. Uh, and uh, we, uh, every line from this Docker file represents a layer in the actual image that will be built. And let's go just line by line and uh, try to get a deeper look to this. So the first line represents the base image uh, on top of which we will build uh, our own image. It will, it will take this image from Docker Hub. It's a sort of GitHub for Docker uh, images. Uh, then we set an environment variable inside of our container. 
Um, then uh, the, the run command just basically runs the uh, command supplied to, the, to this uh, command. So it, it will just create a uh, directory for our code. Uh, then we add this specify f uh, specified file to this directory. So uh, af afterwards, we can just uh, run pip install on it and have all these uh, local Python dependencies uh, inside the image. Then we simply add the code inside of this image. Uh, you may actually wonder why I didn't, uh, I didn't combine the fourth and the sixth line, uh, having like uh, adding all the code uh, before doing the pip install. But actually, there is a reason for that. It's because Docker caches the layers. So uh, if nothing is changed, it will just reuse the, uh, the, layer, the layers of the image from cache. So when you change the code, it shouldn't in, uh, just reinstall the, doing this pip install uh, each and every time. So uh, now that we have the Docker file, let's build an uh, image from it and let's run it. Uh, also, we'll take a look on how to gather the logs from a uh, running container, and we'll try to sneak inside some of containers uh, to gather even more control. So let's begin with the building the images, which is defined by the first argument. Uh, then we specify the image tag, which is basically the image name, and we can even append a column uh, on some of the num uh, and add a, a word and a number, which will define the version of this uh, image. Uh, by, default, by default, this uh, suffix is uh, the word latest. And then we specify uh, this dot, which uh, tells Docker to search uh, for the Docker file in this particular directory. If you want to issue the build command outside from this project, from the project directory, you should specify uh, the full path uh, in which uh, the Docker file is living. <clears throat> and now that we have the image in place, let's run it. Uh, the first attribute is self-explanatory. Uh, then we just uh, map the port from the container, from the running container, to the uh, port uh, from the host, uh, where the Docker uh, daemon is running. Uh, then we specify the image name that was passed before the build stage, so we make sure that we run from this specific image. Then we just run the usual command for running uh, a dev instance of Django. Uh, in this case, uh, all of the application logs will go to the SD out. Uh, now we want to run uh, this as a daemon, uh, as, as is detached. Uh, we can just specify it with this uh, attribute, which is detached. Uh, and in order to be able to identify this container easier from other containers, let's give it a name. And uh, I was mentioning before uh, about the volumes, so let's actually mount the code into the container so we can make the changes to the app on the fly on the dev machine. Uh, well, this, uh, and this is how it's done. And well, this command works, but it's quite of a mess. We'll come to, back to it later. So uh, I was mentioning before uh, gathering the logs. So when you run in detached mode, uh, the logs are not going to a st standard output or so, so you can grab the logs with the docker logs command. Uh, minus F is basically uh, the same, uh, has the same uh, effect as the minus F argument from the GNU tl command, which follows the stream. And here is the uh, name of our container. <coughs> Uh, and if you need for any reason to get inside the running container, you can just execute a shell inside it. Uh, you do it with docker exec. Minus AT uh, means that it will be interactive and it will allocate a pseudo, pseudo TTY uh, for, to be able to interact with the shell. Then it's followed uh, by the name of the container. Uh, <clears throat> and then we specify just this shell that we want to run. Uh, but beware, usually the base images uh, don't have uh, inside of them a uh, fancy shell, so don't try to, ru to run fish or ZSH or other unless uh, it's, it wasn't installed uh, to the image. Also using exact command, you can just execute any other command inside of the container. So uh, the process is totally isolated from the other processes on the same workstation. It has all of its specific dependencies bundled inside. Uh, and these uh, libraries and bins can be distinct from the ones that are installed uh, system-wide uh, on the uh, host that uh, Docker engine is running. 
Uh, and it's disposable, so whether go something goes wrong, uh, you can just stop, delete the specific container, and start again from the same image. But that's obviously not enough. Uh, you may wonder, how about uh, distinct external dependencies, and where is the promised production-like environment? Well, here it is, we'll just need more containers. And that's how our production environment should look like. With different containers, all of them with their specific goal, within their specific scope, and working together in a wonderful synergy, in theory. In order to achieve this synergy, uh, we'll need uh, some kind of orchestration. The orchestration is the automated arrangement, coordination, and management of complex interdependent systems and services. Uh, it should be simple. Uh, we'll consider different approaches for production and uh, dev environments. But the simplest way is to do this with uh, Docker Compose. Um, and this is just how a super simple Docker Compose file looks like. Uh, you can see that I've defined there two services. Um, the, f uh, the first one is just the database using the uh, stock uh, Postgres image from Docker Hub. <clears throat> the second one is the web application, which we were building before. And as you can see, uh, it has all of the uh, variables, the uh, attributes that uh, were defined before manually, uh, defined here statically. So, uh, and we bring up these two containers just with this command. It's just, it's just as simple. And do you remember now the awfully long command from the slide before? Uh, it's just, uh, now all the attributes are uh, statically represented in the config file, so all you need is just this. And if you want to uh, use Compose in prod, uh, you can, uh, or any other uh, the environment which is uh, testing, staging, or whatever, uh, you can create a base YAML file uh, that uh, will c uh, contain all the generic uh, configuration and just extend them uh, for specific uh, environments. So uh, let's say that this is a production compose config, and as you can see, it's uh, at the web uh, container is just uh, not using the uh, Django admin uh, running command, but it's using uwsg, uh, and it depends on Nginx as well. So uh, running Compose in production uh, is not the only way of doing the orchestration, and it's perhaps not the best way as well. I will not go much into details, but let's uh, do a small overview of the industry uh, solutions for orchestration, for uh, logging as well, and for secrets. Uh, so for orchestration in production, um, you can use, of course, Docker Compose as described before, or you can use the Docker Swarm. If you have a swarm of uh, instances running Docker and you want them to socialize with each other. Also, there are external tools uh, that are good for orchestration like console or etcd. Uh, I've also heard people being happy with Zookeeper, though I've never tried that. So, secrets. Um, there are multiple opinions regarding them, uh, but obviously you shouldn't store the secrets, uh, the passwords or the, uh, any other API keys and so in the version control systems. Uh, with Docker, there are different ways of passing secrets to uh, the application, from the environment variables uh, to mounting uh, volumes with the secrets uh, or any other uh, way at the runtime. However, there are third-party tools that are designed just for this task, like Docker Vault, which is built on top of the Vault utility, and Kiwis. Uh, they are they're storing uh, the uh, passwords safely into the host and passes them to the actual running containers at the runtime. And if you're using Kubernetes or Google Container Engine, you have all uh, these features built in. Uh, speaking about logging, uh, starting uh, with the version 1.6, uh, we have different uh, uh, logging drivers and you can easily use them. Um, it strictly depends uh, on your logging decisions at the system level. Uh, but as for the old school basics, uh, you can just use syslog and be happy. And then you have this one person in your team who uses Windows. Good for them, uh, because there is now Docker for Windows. Uh, but seriously, uh, if you're developing on Windows or Mac, uh, you know that you cannot run uh, Docker natively on your machine. 
But now we're not forced anymore to use uh, VirtualBox, VMware, Parallels, or other hypervisor virtualization tool because there is the new Docker for Mac and Windows, and it works blazingly fast, at least on Macs. Uh, on Macs, they use, uh, they use XHive, which is a super lightweight virtualization solution for OS X uh, with almost no overhead, and on Windows, they use Hyper-V. Well, summing this up, uh, that's a nice way of building environments that behave in the same way in production and in development. So it's really easy to make self-contained packages uh, with all the particular dependencies inside them. So even with some exotic dependencies that do, do not exist in the wild world. Also, having uh, them immutable guarantees that uh, there are no difference in time, uh, no diverse problem related to this kind of car. Uh, and also isolating them from uh, from each other, uh, just and just explicitly uh, specifying the uh, interfaces or uh, allowing particular containers to communicate with other containers uh, minimizes the risk of unexpected conflicts. Uh, and all these characteristics improve the overall robustness of the application in relation to its environment. So that's basically it. Thank you. So uh, as, as we are behind the, of the schedule, we, uh, I will just be hanging out around this entrance of this room. We have two minutes. Oh, okay. If yeah, we have, we have time for, I think, one or two questions. Does anyone have a question? Um, hi, thank you. An excellent talk. Uh, absolutely five stars. Um, I, um, I have a question. So Docker versus Docker machine. So a lot of people say, like, Docker machine, I don't, like, you know, uh, Docker is superior. Uh, what's your opinion on that? And also, uh, what's your opinion? Like, so my use case, if you kind of develop on Windows, you have, you're forced to use uh, Linux kernels to run your images. Yes, Thank but you. now we can, you can try this uh, beta uh, Docker from and Windows, and it's Oh, it's not? Okay. It works for me. <laughs> uh, anyway, yeah, if, if that's not working for, in your case, <laughs> you, you can uh, just uh, use the old school way of uh, having a virtual, ma a virtual machine and uh, running a Linux kernel, and then use Docker machine or whatever uh, to, to connect to it and work, to work with it. But uh, as it's not working for you, you can file a bug because it's still in beta and the guys will help you and perhaps you'll <laughs> uncover this problem. Cool. Uh, one more question? Going once, going twice. <laughs> okay, then please thank our speaker, Mikhail, again. Thanks.